Boy, it'd be nice if we could build a bridge that fast. Anyway, that's great. <laughs> okay. All right. On behalf of Student Council, myself and Mr. Dykstra got a few things to explain about the upcoming Boxland Social. Um, it's next Friday, April 29. And uh, it's always been an annual fundraiser. Uh, this year, um, the girls will do the buying and the guys do the cooking. Um, and so what we'll need to have, uh, what it is for is to, to raise funds. We've raised funds in the past for a um, variety of organizations, speakers that have come to chapel, that kind of thing. Uh, we've always raised somewhere in the vicinity of around $3,000 plus dollars from the student body on that. And so more details will come to the freshmen uh, later today in Ms. Van Dyke's class uh, by a student council as responsibility so they know more about it. But for the upper class, what we know is, is that the uh, guys will have to prepare a meal and the girls will be buying this year. Now, the one part is, of course, is signing up, okay? And um, so we're, we're going to start that t tomorrow. But it's going to go a little differently this year. It's, you're not going to be uh, signing up on a sheet of paper in the library. Uh, you're going to come to the office and get a slip that will be marked uh, basically for ladies. And most of you will be signing up uh, in groups of five and a couple fours to make things balance out for a number of tables. Uh, the girls or the guys will be basically in groups of four with maybe a couple threes, okay, to balance that out. But one of the things we need to do today in order to get that set up is that we know that uh, there are some conflicts for next Friday, and, and uh, Mr. Dykstra is going to talk about that. We actually looked at changing the date to May 6 or April 29. We went back and forth on those dates, and, and both days have complications. On May 6, it's Dort's graduation, and that probably means that if you have a sibling who's graduating or if you have a relative that's graduating, there's a chance that some of you may be gone for that. Um, on April 29, the challenge we have is it is the prom for three different high schools. Sioux Falls Christian has their prom that night, MOC has their prom, and Sioux Center has that their prom that night. So we understand that for some of you, if you've been invited to be a guest at one of those proms, um, it's likely that you're going to want to be out of here as soon as possible on that day. I, I just really would encourage you um, to be here if you haven't made that appointment for your hair or if you haven't picked a time to do something that you need to do to prepare for prom in one of those three schools. We'd really encourage you. I think it's one of the best days of our school year. Um, it is always a blast, and uh, it's a lot of fun for making food. Freshmen, you'll experience that for the first time. Uh, but we really would encourage you, if at all possible, to be here. So I'm going to send out an email to all of you, to the Unity community, and I'd like those of you who know you have a conflict on uh, April 29 to directly email me back um, what it is that's causing the conflict. Because we really, getting our groups right is a big deal. It's, it's stressful to find a group and to be included in a group and to do that well. And so we really want to do that well, but we're going to need some cooperation from you to be here if at all possible. And if you can't be here, to let us know. Okay? And that email will come out today if you want to look for that in your, in your inbox. All right. At this time, will you please join me in welcoming our good friend from Dort College and One Body, One Hope, Aaron Bart. I feel kind of schizophrenic when I come here. I feel like sometimes I'm coming and I put the Dean of Chapel at Dort hat on and we come with the Dort team and do chapel and sometimes I come and share messages and updates on One Body, One Hope. So thanks for being willing to listen to me a couple different times um, over the course of a year, being able to share with you. This past year, we were able to grow a ton as a ministry. You guys have been a part of this. There's lots of different people have been a part of this. Uh, 2015, three, 397 different individual schools or churches contributed to fundraising over $400,000 that planted six churches, started new orphanages, schools, bought farms, and continued to participate in redevelopment in Liberia. And it's been incredible for us to watch people in Sioux County get excited about something on the other side of the world. And I want to give you a little bit of an update on some of the things that we've been doing um, and that you've got to be a part of in different ways. 
and then from there um, go forward and share a little bit of a message of sort of the theological undergirdings of why we do what we do and why we want to talk to other people about doing these sorts of things with our lives. Okay, so the, one of the most recent projects we did, you saw the video coming in, was the bridge project. We built a bridge um, with four civil engineering seniors at Dort College. That was their senior design project. They raised $44,000 and were able to complete a bridge on the other side of the world, shipping everything there. So it was an absolute ton of fun to get to do. I went with them um, over Christmas break, and um, got to see that and then see that vehicle driven over at the very end, connecting new communities, planting new churches, establishing a farm. This is the river we had to cross. Old beams taken from Sioux Center Hospital. Bible verses inscribed on the pillars that would go. And then on the last day of the year, it was actually com completed. And there's the finished product. It's pretty fun to see um, students dreaming about what they can actually do and how they can participate in um, what I constantly refer to as um, global transformation through Christ-centered fascination. Just teaching the world to be in love with Christ and all the things that he's about and making all things new. We had a lot of growth at a second orphanage that we have called Christ Our Hope North. This is in the city of Foya, which was the epicenter of the Ebola outbreak. You can see our caretakers and then some of the kids who were there. And I'm so excited just at absolutely how healthy these kids have become uh, because somebody on the other side of the world decided to care and decided to get involved or give something up, whether it was a coffee each day and 40 bucks a month and a sponsorship or just little things that we do in our lives, little self-denial activities can create a world of difference for somebody else on the other side of the world. Been working at new church plants. One of the things that we do is we go into communities like this, um, incredibly remote communities, often completely unreached peoples. There are 275,000 completely unreached, never heard the gospel before people in the country of Liberia. We go into places like this. Sometimes they're very animistic um, in their beliefs. So they believe in like go um, gods of nature. Other times, uh, once in a while, they're very Islamic. And these are the types of places where we go into. Um, hold crusades like this. This is an altar call at the end of a crusade last month um, in, a, in Grand Cape Mount. And this is the altar call at the end of the evening with everybody else who's gone in the background, the people who have all come forward to give their lives to Christ. So we have a crusade season where Pastor Emmanuel goes out into these new communities, preaches the gospel for three or four days at a time in a town, and then offers a time of discipleship and training, and people come forward um, giving their lives. We actually saw over 1,200 people in the last several weeks um, give their lives to Christ um, and plant new churches through these endeavors. So it's been incredibly inspiring to see. And then to get to be a part of um, actually getting to be there and, and, and baptizing people once these opportunities are done. I got to do that with 39 um, kids after a national youth conference that we had there in January who came forward, um, gave their lives to Christ, and got to stand in the ocean and baptize them. And kind of a highlight of a highlight of ministry for me. Um, some of the new church plants that happened last year were in these towns, Salala, Kakata, Bong Marsh Road, Todi, and Keba. And initial churches, the first structures look like this. We build them in pieces. So you can see we start with a sort of a foundation that's lifted up, and then we build the roof um, first. Um, sometimes they end up looking like this, where we begin to what they call parging the walls. Um, in order to keep rains out, because in the rainy season, they get about 120 inches of rainfall. But they do construction backwards. We always start with the roof, because um, when the rainy season comes, you want to at least be able to stay dry. So churches will often look like this for a long time as they get built in, in pieces. You can't take out loans there from banks, so you have to build everything as the money comes in. Last year, we were able to get back on track with um, a whole lot of different trips, First, just to reconnect after Ebola, um, a team from New Life Church in Sioux Center went along, some new business endeavors there, a group from Bridge of Hope looked after some medical needs. So here's all the guys who went on the bridge team um, to build that. We do a lot of pastors training for these new churches, uh, being able to teach pastors. So a retired pastor from our area, um, Reverend Dan DeGroat, goes there for um, up to three, three plus weeks a year and just spends time in training with our pastors. A uh, team from 10 Credit Electric went um, in February and wired the entire school and set it all up. So we actually now have indoor plumbing and electrical all through their school. Um, you know, we got to celebrate at Unity when places like this get built. It was a big deal for them. They finally got electricity in their school, and they finally got plumbing in their school. So up until then, nobody had ever even had a bathroom 
inside their school. There were simply facilities out back behind the bushes. So that's a big, big deal for them and ho hopefully will cut down on a lot of um, health and hygiene concerns for us. We started a 160-acre farm this past year that's still in development. Um, and that's been a really, really exciting thing for us. One of the new projects we're doing is we just started this month. Um, there was a U.S. televangelist that went to Liberia and started a place called Abundant Life Children's Welfare Home. Um, they did a giant fundraiser, came up with about a million dollars and built this facility. Something happened in their organizational structure and they ended up bailing. Um, and so this orphanage home that was set up for 32 um, kids who had lost their parents to Ebola was abandoned. And the leaders came to us and said, will you come in, will you take this over for us? And we had no, no idea, of course, how to do this. Um, but you just say yes when somebody asks you, and then you find God meets you in these places. And so it's just been one adventure after another. We keep calling these Jesus adventures that he's taken us on and um, stepping out in a place of faith and finding where God meets us there. So we ended up getting an incredibly, um, incredibly well-built new facility um, through, through this sort of takeover, I guess, of abundant life. And there's the kids who all live there. So anyways, those are some of the updates by way of things that we've been had going on um, within our ministry and hopefully get to keep coming back and tell you guys some more about that and why we're so excited. Um, but I want to talk to you too, like I said this morning, about just sort of why we do what we do, why I think this stuff is important, why I want you guys to be thinking about how it is that I'm organizing my life. So let's talk about the way you organize your life for a minute. Indulge me for just a second and go ahead and close your eyes, Okay. Imagine your life 10 years from now. You try to get pictures in your mind. What does it look like? Where do you live? What are you doing for work? What does your environment look like? And who's all around you? Where's it all going? What are you working towards? Open your eyes again if you would. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Now I'm going to ask you a hard question of everything that you sort of imagine when you picture your life ten years from now. How Christocentric was that picture? How wrapped around Jesus' inbreaking of the kingdom of God was the future that we imagine. Somebody did this for me recently, and I went through this exercise, and I realized that when they made me open my eyes, they opened my eyes not just literally, but in a new way. Realizing that so much of what I work towards in the world is actually much more about me and the things that I want to accomplish than about what Christ is doing in the world. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. So the first step of discipleship that Jesus introduces in this passage is deny yourself. You'll remember from the text, if you know this story well, this is immediately following where Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to have to die. And then Peter says, absolutely not. It says that Peter rebukes Jesus in this moment. And then Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And then Jesus follows with this teaching. Peter, you need to understand that life is not about what you want to accomplish. Peter, you need to understand that I didn't make you to come alive when you get everything that your heart wants. I made you to come alive when you deny yourself. Part of becoming a grown-up, mature Christian is learning almost to distrust our initial impulses that are always self-interested. I think by nature, we all have to be able to admit, I'm more interested in me than I am in anybody else in this world. I am. That's part of my sinful nature. 
And so growing up into Christ means moving beyond myself, gaining an interest in the things that are happening in the world, gaining an interest in the ministries in my community and on the other side of the world, learning to love my neighbor as much as I love my own dreams, wanting their dreams to come true in life, their vision of what they want 10 years from now as much as I want mine. And maybe that means giving up a little piece of mine in order for them to have theirs too. In other words, a translation of this part of the text, I would say, is Jesus saves us from ourselves. Jesus saves us from being our own worst enemy. Jesus says, deny yourself because what you want to get just for you will not actually give you what you think it will. But I can. I came that you would have life and have it to the full. I'm reading a book right now by a man named James Smith. It's called You Are What You Love. And the whole idea is that we wrap our lives all around the things that we love. Everything in our lives, everything that we prioritize is all wrapped around the things that our heart gets most excited about. So this line struck me in the book. To be human is to be animated and oriented by some vision of the good life. That we come alive, that we get most excited, that we find our dreams and desires from the things that our hearts love the most. Another way he puts it is this. Love is like autopilot, orienting us without our even thinking about it. You, when I asked you to close your eyes, you didn't even have to think about what it is that you were imagining, but chances are what you saw when you closed your eyes are the things that your heart is actually the most in love with. I think that's incredibly telling for us. It's sort of like a mirror gets put up in front of us saying, this is what is actually inside of us. It's the things that I dream about when I fall asleep at night. It's the, the cars that I get excited about when I drive by them in the car lot. It's the things that I imagine are going to make my life easier in some way, shape, or form. The job that will say something about me. The paycheck that will declare something to the rest of the world that this is what I am worth. I think we are often more in love than these things that we want to admit. And so it's not an accident that Jesus summarizes the first step of discipleship to deny yourself. I think part of your Christian education and why your parents invest tuition the way that they do in order for you to be in a school like this is so that you will become more excited about what God is doing in the world than what you and I can do in our own lives. Deny yourself. Reorient our loves. Let the love of Christ come in and take over so we are not moving just out of our own interests, but out of his and the things that really make us come alive. And then he says, take up your cross. And we understand that this has to do with a, that there will be some sort of struggle. But I think that there's, um, I guess what I would call a fallacy of struggle in Christian understanding in America today. We often think that the struggle of the Christian is us against the world. It's us against the evil world out there. It's the things that we're being taught that the Bible is centered upon and that Christ wants to do, and then the rest of the world that's fighting against it. But I don't think that that's necessarily it. The greatest struggle that you will ever embark on is the one that is inside of you. It's whether or not we're willing to deny ourselves enough to open up our lives and let the love of Christ come in and begin to transform everything. Jesus' plan for the transformation of the world isn't Christians against the world. It's not us against culture. Jesus' plan for the transformation of the world was him putting his Holy Spirit inside of you and the fruit that would come out of it and the gifts that would come out of it and the blessings that would come out of it and that the world would be transformed by your fascination with Jesus. And that the further we move into him, the more almost accidentally the world changes because we just become more animated, more alive when we find ourselves in him. And then this is the way that I think that when Jesus says, take up your cross, this is Jesus saving us from the world. Saving us from our interest in the world. Saving us from, from the American dream. Saving us from a, a primary goal of life that's just about making things easier for us. He saves us from the world. It's not just fighting everything else beyond us. Billy Graham, near the end of his life, when sort of asked about some hot topic issues that were going on in the world at the time, he responded like this. He said, it's God's job to judge, the Spirit's job to convict, and my job to love. 
So I want, you to, I want these words to sink in for a second. Look at the last line that Billy Graham offers. The greatest evangelist that the world has seen in the last 150 years at the end of the day said that he believed the world was going to change because of his call to love. He didn't have to argue people into the kingdom of God. He didn't have to convince them. He didn't need to strong arm them. He didn't need a politician that sat in a particular office. He didn't need this person to do it for him. He didn't need stronger words. He didn't need a bigger wall. He didn't want more anger. He didn't need more frustration. He didn't want the world or Christians putting themselves up against the rest of the world. It's God's job to judge, the Spirit's job to convict, and my job to love. The greatest evangelist of the last 150 years believed that the world would change Christ-centered fascination. I'm just going to learn how to love. It's an incredibly powerful statement. So deny yourself, Jesus says. Take up your cross. So understand what the struggle is really about. It's not you against the world that's against you. It's you trying to learn how to absorb more grace and absorb more of God and let the love of Him flow out of you to change your environment. And then follow me. Follow me where? Jesus, if you're going to save me from myself, you're going to save me from the world, then where exactly are we going? Is this just sort of heavenly minded? Jesus saves us from ourselves, and he saves us from the world, but he saves us for the world so that we can go back in. Jesus wants to take you into the heart of darkness, into the worst places and the darkest places inside your own heart and in the darkest places in this world. Where the light of Christ can come and it can shine and it can change things. Shining light into darkness. That's the metaphor that Jesus uses again and again, isn't it? Jesus didn't just save us for ourselves. He saved us for the world so we would be given away, so we would be spent. Somebody asked me recently, what's one of the goals of your life? And I thought about it for a long time and then I said, at the end of the day when I walk walk into the kingdom of God, when it comes in its completion, I hope I fall across the finish line. I hope I've spent myself so much in Christ's behalf that I just simply fall across. That my entire world was wrapped around a Christocentric vision, a vision of Jesus in all things, that the things of the world weren't capturing my imagination, but the things of the cross and of what Christ wants to accomplish, about seeing people made new, about seeing a world redeemed and restored, that I wasn't about a person who was waiting for heaven to come, but I was a person who was seeing and being part of heaven breaking in. Now, Jesus said, That's what his ministry was about. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of God is now and it is not yet. And we stand in this place and we are the bridge that is bringing heaven here now when we engage in things like loving our neighbor and denying ourselves and taking up a cross and following him back into all of us. Last month, we hired our first ever full-time employee for One Body, One Hope. One of the students who came along on this bridge project, he's been on three different trips with me to Liberia. He's an incredibly bright young man, and he'd be so embarrassed if I was telling the story about him right now. But I was so enthralled watching him work. Graduating from Dort College with an engineering degree, the world at his fingertips, job offers, lots of money, lots of options. And instead, choosing to do something, he asked and wanted to come forward and say, I, I, I want to do this with my life. I was so excited. I never came more alive than when I was there with these people. I think that each one of us has like a, a version of our dream in life that's really selfish, if we're really honest. And another version of our dream in life, if we'll just trust God, will actually make us come even more alive. To watch an engineer's face light up at the thought of taking a job that pays half as much money, but to be about the things that God is about in the world. I think that's what God's calling us to, and I think that's an inspiring vision of someone who's learning to deny themselves and take up their cross and follow him. And I can't wait to see what God's going to keep doing in Austin's life because of those choices. We don't use this a whole lot, this imagery in the Western church, but in the Eastern church, it's alive and well. In their iconography, which is sort of their version of art and all the things that would get put up in their temples and, or their, their, their churches and, and their artwork, their iconography, the Eastern church has always associated the cross with the tree of life. 
that it was through dying that life actually comes. That the cross is the gift of life. That when you and I take up our cross, we actually become more alive. We don't become more dead. We become more alive. And I love that picture that the Eastern Church has preserved, that the cross is the tree of life. It's the entrance back into the way things were supposed to be. That's the portal back. It is through the cross that we find our place back in Eden. It's through the cross that we find our place moving into the kingdom of God as it comes. The cross isn't just an instrument of death. The cross is the path to life. And not just for Jesus, but for Jesus saying to everyone who would come after him, take up your cross and follow me. Jesus, do we believe that you're taking us and leading us to somewhere good? So I wanted to just come in this morning and challenge you guys with what is your vision? What is it you really want for your life? And I want you to maybe fall asleep tonight thinking about what are the things that are capturing my imagination the most? And ask yourself a hard question. Is the vision for my life and my dream truly Christocentric? Is it still about me or is it more about Christ? I, there are days, you guys, and I'll admit it, I catch myself and I drift right back again. It's so easy to do. One of the great Christian pastors of the last century, Eugene Peterson, always talked about practicing resurrection. The, this is something that we actually lo- have to learn how to do because it doesn't come all that naturally to us. And every day of your life, we're going to learn how to do this again and again, to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him so we can be saved from ourselves and saved from the world. We can be saved for the world. You join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for the the ways that you've taught us through your son, Jesus, of the ways of life. That even when part of us wants to resist the fact of giving things up, it's hard to imagine that you actually have even more in store. That we're actually trading in something paler for something much more vivid and much more beautiful. But God, through the work of your Holy Spirit within us, teach us to be more excited, more animated about visions of the kingdom than visions of our own empires. God, allow us to become excited about the things that you're excited about. Teach our hearts to break for the things that break your heart. And for all the students in this room, God, I pray that they would have Christocentric visions for their life. That you would make them come more alive than they could ever even imagine possible. Because you are alive in them. That you are alive in them in such a way that the problems of this world can't touch them in the same way. It can't hurt them in the same way. It can't steal from them in the same way because you have given them a life that is so far beyond it. Father God, dwell richly in these students. May your word take root here and your spirit cause them to become more alive than anything the world could ever offer. In the sacrificial and risen name of Jesus, together we pray. Amen. Have an incredible day.